if you are just joining, we'll do our normal. Um, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, your name, organization, and then your role, that would be great. people a few moments. Mary, I love seeing your face. It's so exciting when I get to like interact and see people. I'm like, I'm not just alone in my living room. <clears throat> Gonna give people a few more moments. We're gonna be starting with team presentations. So I just wanna make sure that they're on the call. Oh, yay, faces, more faces. Yay. <laughs> Hi, um, if you're just, is, go sorry, ahead. this is Lee Northrup from Banner Health. Yeah. And I have a medical informatics, excuse me, a nursing informatics master's student with me. Yeah. Can I ask that she could be invited to this as well? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, do you need a link? Um, for her, yes. She was unable to get in, uh, yeah. pulling it off of my calendar. Let me see if I can grab that for you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to drop it in the chat for you. Thank you. See if that link will work. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll get started. Let me pull my PowerPoint back up. Okay, so if you're just joining again, just put in your name, your organization, and then your role in the chat. Um, but we'll get started with team presentations. Um, but first, I'm Elena. Um, I'm the project manager, and I also have Stacy with me today. Um, Katie couldn't make it today. Um, she is actually um, in Mexico on vacation, um, well deserved. So um, if you have any questions, we have the same um, uh, knowledge and role as Katie, so you can ask us as well. Um, so we're gonna start, I believe that I saw the Good Samaritan team, so I'll start with them. Um, if you have a PowerPoint, you're welcome to um, take over the screen. Uh, if not, we can just close out my screen um, and get started. Okay, I do not have the PowerPoint, so. Okay, feel free to just talk. Okay. <laughs> so we started using the um, data collection sheets maybe two months ago, and we have our case manager that's assigned to postpartum who's been doing that and following those patients. Um, we've been able to capture a few. There's not, there hasn't been too many, which is a good thing, um, but we have been able to capture a few and be able to give them more resources than previously. Um, one thing my case manager mentioned to me today was that this has just been super helpful for her because she's been able to learn or she's been able to um, identify inpatient treatment options for low-income patients um, and specifically facilities where moms can bring their babies into the treatment facility. So she's identified those which has helped her on the postpartum side as well as in the rest of the hospital with other patients. Um, 
which has been great. Uh, if we need, I don't know if we have a list or places where there's resources, if this is something that we would like to share, um, I've got the names of those places as well. Yeah, I'm sure um, that um, you could add those to the team resources folder. I don't know if um, you know how to add to that, but you can also email it to us and then we can um, drop it into that folder. Okay. Um, just because you are in the Denver, Denver metro area and there are a couple other hospitals in your area, I think that would be really useful for teams. Perfect. Um, yeah, just for other teams to know, we do have that folder um, and it has a whole database of resources from around the state. I mean, it's sorted by different topics. So um, kind of from simply just referral um, to different outpatient providers, but it also kind of has more uh, smaller stuff such as like childcare centers, um, MAT treatment centers, stuff like that. Great. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I can do that. I can, um, I'll either, I'll try and add them and then if not, I'll email them to you as Yeah, well. sounds good. Um, but that's kind of the, the update that I have or the um, information I have. Awesome. Does anyone have any questions for the Good Sam team about how their implementation has been going? Um, I know everyone else is doing the same thing at the same time, so um, if you have any questions, because they seem to be having it go pretty well. Um, so if you have any questions for them, feel free to come off mute or put it in the chat and I'm happy to ask it. If not. We're going to talk about that a little bit later too. So if anything comes up, feel free to ask um, Abby. But um, right now, thank you so much, Abby. And we'll move on to the Lutheran team who will be now presenting. Um, I think I just saw Amy join the call. Um, Amy, are you good to present? You have mine. I let me check my email. Did you email it to me? Mm -hmm. I shared it with you. Otherwise, I can present. It's just so brief. I thought it would be easy to. I can share my screen. Yeah, why don't you share your screen? That's OK. Can you see it? Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. Oopsie, start at the very end. <laughs> Look at that, Intermountain Healthcare. Not the most professional of uh, copy and paste, but there it is. Uh, and um, my name is Amy. I am at Lutheran Medical Center as the OB um, Professional Development Specialist. And I'm also um, kind of trying to facilitate, trying is a good word, um, our system moving in the same direction. So um, for purposes of today, I'm just gonna focus on Lutheran, which is uh, Lutheran Medical Center, which is in Wheat Ridge, and um, talk about what we're doing. So as a system, we went live with the Audit C plus two screening tool in Epic. Um, at, and as a system, we also developed a maternal mental health screening policy that incorporates um, how our frequency for screening for substance use disorder. So for those um, clinics that are SCL health, uh, they decided to screen, I believe it's first trimester and maybe again at 28 weeks, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but for purposes of Lutheran, I don't have any SCL clinics. So we are screening um, all inpatients on arrival. Um, and then I think that's the clinics also screen again post-delivery um, at their postpartum visit. But for purposes of Lutheran, we screen um, on admission and social determinants of health was built into the EPIC system. So I put a screenshot and you can see, uh, here's what it looks like when I pull it up in EPIC, the screening was done and my patient was low risk. Here's a picture on the right of the Audit C plus tool to um, tool that we use, and then it cascades when you get a positive. But what I'm most excited about 
is that when we went live um, for the month of March, screening was um, probably about 50%. And in April, I just pulled our numbers and look at that, we are at, um, I mean, I'm just, yeah, thrilled, 86%. So we had 150 deliveries in the month of April and 130 of those screened low risk, five were high risk and 15 did not get screened. Um, so we are well on our way to um, incorporating this into our daily workflow and making it um, just um, a part of our daily work. And of those five, I have not looked to see what was done for these patients, but my hunch is this triggered a case management screen and referral and that they were seen. So super excited. We made great progress in one month's time. And I love that there's a report that I can pull that I can see how many high-risk patients we had. Yay. Um, we uh, had this in place, but I wanted to point it out um, because this is a piece of uh, what we're working on. We have an order set for with um, patients experiencing withdrawal who are pregnant, OB opiate, um, withdrawal treatment order set. This is available for our whole system. Um, Lutheran uses it quite a bit. Um, and so I just wanted to put that in there um, because it's also then a piece of the policies that we're working on. So um, these are two policies yeah. that are drafted. Um, they're ready to go for Lutheran, um, but the SEL team decided we would make them um, system-wide. So I'm working through the process of making these SEL policies. One of them is for acute withdrawal, and then it refers to that order set. And then the other one is um, acute pain management protocol for the patient with substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And I am um, really excited about this policy because it gives us a lot of alternative options for pain management. Um, I had a patient just recently who um, was, um, no, she's in um, treatment, a treatment facility. She's, she delivered here and we were giving her a tap block for her post-op pain proactively. Um, and then that, it, and there's a series of events around this particular patient. She ended up not getting that. So we're struggling a little bit with helping her manage her pain. And so yesterday we were able to talk to a clinic that prescribes for her um, Suboxone and we um, were able to up her dose and split it. And so it gives some of those types of tips in the policy as well. So super excited about this policy. Um, the only thing holding us back right now from uh, proving it is that we have different workflows on um, sending urine drug screen. And so I'm working with our legal department to kind of give us some guidance and solidify what that work sh workflow should be. Um, otherwise I anticipate moving this forward within the next month. And then Lutheran specific, um, we are implementing naloxone for those high risk patients. So um, it's, our staff are in the midst of receiving education through an e-learning module. And then we're going to do some specific training um, at change of shift in our huddles. Um, and our biggest thing has been working with our outpatient pharmacy and how to enter the order so that it triggers a meds to beds process. The outpatient pharmacy will get the order and then they'll bring it to the patient's bedside so that they can, the nurse can um, show a family member, demonstrate how to use it. So we're working on some scripting, videotaping, um, what that education should look like. Our, patients, our nurses are worried that they're going to come off sounding kind of judgy. So they really want to work on the scripting that they use with these patients when they introduce this for discharge. So today is my first patient, actually. We're trying to link. Um, she's all on board. And we wrote the order, and it, the order didn't go through. So um, there's lots of like little kinks in the process to work out. So I'm glad I had a, a trial patient to focus on. That's what I've got.
I'll stop sharing. Yeah, you have a question in the chat that I'll read out to you. It says, what about post-vaginal birth pain for substance users? Do you have any protocols written for them? How are you managing those patients? Um, we could, I mean, just really vaginal delivered patients as, as a whole, we've worked really hard on not giving any um, opiates to, and you just using around the clock Tylenol and ibuprofen, and then using our non-farm pain management tools. Um, so we really haven't had to address this, although I think my providers would be pretty comfortable with adjusting their dosage of their, um, if they're on Subutex, we could adjust that dosing with the help of the clinic. Great, and then my, I actually had a question for you. Um, for your like scripting, because you're saying that your nurses were worried about coming off as judgmental or not really knowing what to say. Um, are you, do you have scripts that you're using for that or um, are you making them up as you go? Oh, um, well, the, um, the Naloxone Colorado Project, is that the name of it? Yes, I think that's it. Colorado um, Naloxone Project. Colorado Naloxone Project. <laughs> um, they have a toolkit. So actually I'm in the process of sifting through that toolkit to see if there's anything that's available. And otherwise we're gonna make a homegrown video that shows like uh, a nurse um, talking to a patient and kind of giving some ideas for them of what they could say. Right. Yeah, I know that that uh, um, common question that comes up for us, not just in regards to naloxone, but in regards to just screening in general is just kind of, if you haven't done it before, it doesn't really flow and it comes out, you're like, ooh, I don't know what to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we do have a couple scripts um, in the team resources folder. And then I know um, that uh, Kevin in the expert training also has some techniques for having conversations as well. Um, and Mariah, it's called the Colorado Naloxone Project. Uh, it's a naloxone um, project that was started in emergency departments, um, specifically at Swedish Medical Center. Um, and we're working to try to get naloxone now in the labor and delivery units as kind of like the second tier um, model of implementation for that project. Uh, if you want more information, I'm happy to email that to you. But thank you so much, Amy, for sharing. That was yeah. awesome. I'm so excited to see those screening rates. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Oh, it uh, looks like Summer has a question. Yeah, I have another question for you, Amy. Hi, I'm, I'd turn on my video, but it's apparently not working. Um, <laughs> so um, I just have sort of a follow-up to that question about the post-vaginal birth too. And um, I, and, and for anybody, I would say this is a question kind of across the board. I remember having a patient when I was working in the hospital who was, probably actively using right before birth, right? And was post postpartum then recovery, baby was in the NICU. Um, and she was not getting anything other than Tylenol and ibuprofen. And she was really in a bad place. So they, of course we'd ordered, you know, a psych eval and behavioral health and social work had already come, but the the this this behavioral health evaluation could not be done timely, right? Like it, we had been waiting already many, many, many hours. And she is continuously ramping up, right? And having difficulty. And um, I'm trying to remember, I think she actually left perhaps AMA, right? Because she was so agitated and not getting any help. And she was frustrated with the doctor and the doctor did refuse to do anything. She said that, you know, her argument was that best practice was to not, you know, as her OB, um, not do anything, um, for this patient other than what was happening and just wait for the behavioral health. And I felt very helpless, you know, as a floor nurse for this patient. Um, I just wondering if anybody has any ideas or Amy, if you've come across that in terms of what could be done when those little things, right? Like there's always going to be those, well, it's going to take time or the, the social worker can't get here or the behavioral health person can't get, here. <laughs> you know, it's like, what can we do for patients like that? Well, we definitely, in those scenarios, um, I pulled, I, start, I started sharing my screen again um, because we have the withdrawal 
order set. So there's lots of tools on here that we could order for that patient that's starting to get really anxious because they are starting to experience withdrawal symptoms. Um, and right. yeah. I don't know if that, I mean, that's from a medical perspective that doesn't help with the scripting and the acceleration of the evaluation that needs to yeah, happen. But this, so this is an order set you guys have though, the doctors have for possible other medications, right? That might work then for mm -hmm. So hey, this can I like be, have a pen. that's great. I mean, this can definitely be used for vaginal. Yeah. Um, this can be used for laboring patients or um, patients who have delivered that. Delivered. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Honestly, it could probably be used for C-section patients too, but those are a little more complex sure. in terms of, you know, making sure you're not over medicating. We added gabapentin into um, a patient's regime yesterday. She's trying, um, she's really trying hard not to take any opiates. Yeah. Um, How is that working? Um, good so far. Yeah. She, and she was really excited by the option of it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. I like that. Yeah. Thank okay. you. I just, I don't know if anybody else has anything else that they could share of what maybe okay. has been done or to empower, um, folks, you know, um, in those situations, perhaps. And I see that Dr. Cleese on the call actually helped us develop that order set. So I don't know if yeah. Um, Kaylin, you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So um, it is absolutely legal inside the hospital or the emergency department to give any opioid for opioid withdrawal. It does not have to be only methadone or buprenorphine. Now, outside of the emergency department and outside of inpatient in the hospital, methadone and buprenorphine are the only opioids that are approved to treat opioid withdrawal, right? So that's a legal difference. But inside the hospital, when you have somebody who is in active opioid withdrawal, it is absolutely legal to alleviate their opioid withdrawal with all of those medications that are part of Amy's gorgeous order set and opioids if needed. That is completely legal to do. Now I understand that there is gonna be a difference in comfort level with that, but I promise you, you will not make anyone's opioid use disorder worse by treating their acute withdrawal with opioids in a controlled setting. I totally appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> like I, I, you know, that was my perspective as the nurse and totally. I, but I appreciate, I really appreciate you, you know, sort of laying and putting that out there again for people that that's so important. Yeah. And you don't have to, I mean, methadone is a little trickier because if you give methadone in the hospital, hopefully you've got a link to like methadone outpatient, but you don't also, you also as a provider don't have to have an X waiver or a special buprenorphine license to give buprenorphine in the hospital. That is something that sometimes like providers and pharmacies get confused about, but that is just like any other opioid, right? You could order oxycodone to treat opioid withdrawal in the hospital. Um, it's legal to do so according to the DEA. <laughs> um, and so I think in that scenario, if somebody is going to leave the hospital and you want them to continue to get medical care and resources and a full, an assessment, and you can help them stay comfortably in the hospital to get all that good care, then it's okay to give we don't have to snow people, right? We don't have to give them a Dilaudid PCA, but it's okay to give people opioids to alleviate opioid withdrawal as a bridge to a more complete substance assessment and treatment um, recommendation. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Cleese. And just um, thank you, Summer. So Summer, Thank you for being uncomfortable with that scenario, yeah. right? Of being like, this is not in the best patient, this is not in the patient's best interest to withhold um, medication, even if it feels kind of like complicated to grab, to jump to like, well, this person misuses opioids, so should I give them opioids? You will not make it, that horse has left the barn, right? Like, it's right. not gonna make it worse. And so yeah, yeah. yeah. totally. I, I yeah, it was it was a 
um, was not a great situation, right? Um, for sure, and uh, with my interaction with the provider, but um, she printed off like 42 pages of an up-to-date study about not giving opioids to users. And I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> I was really sad um, because this patient, you know, was, was obviously hurting and was really not being cared for. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, and you know. For people, yeah, same for people who are already on treatment medicine. So if somebody's on methadone, somebody's on buprenorphine, yeah. has a C-section, has a complicated vaginal delivery, they're in pain, non-opioids are not cutting it. It is not wrong to give opioids, especially in the hospital. It's such a controlled setting, right? Right. That, um, you know, you can observe the person even taking the medication, right? It's not the same as sending people home with a big prescription for them to manage themselves. But in the hospital, it is absolutely not wrong to give other opioids on top of treatment medicine to alleviate acute pain. That's great. I appreciate that. Hopefully it will improve, right? In this I'll keep, in the we'll keep shouting from the rooftops, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it really takes folks like yourself who are uncomfortable with that, who become uncomfortable with seeing that scenario play out to really continue to advocate for like, hey, let's get some more education. Let's get, you know, so bravo. Nice job. And um after this call, um, I'll put that uh, slide deck from Amy into the team resources folder um, um, so that everyone can share. Um, hope you're okay with that, Amy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We yeah. should all have that order set and be using yeah. it. It's yeah. been a godsend to us and it's um, really just helps us from recreating the wheel or feeling helpless or, you know, um, different providers that have different levels of experience and it just helps con create consistency. And actually I'm working on one right now as well for marijuana, um, kind of benoid hyperemesis syndrome is that, um, because we're seeing that a lot more too. And every single time we reinvent the wheel yeah. or under treat. Yeah, and <clears throat> every, um, the other like protocols that Amy has come up with there in that team resources folder, which I just put in the chat. Um, I know you've come out with a couple, I don't remember off the top of my head what they are, but I'll keep putting them in there and I'll try to email blast them out. Um, when I remember, I don't want to like jam your inboxes, but um, Amy's definitely been doing a really great job with making those um, protocols. So when we just save them all to our favorites and answer to your question in the chat, like uh, I just educate, educate, educate. We cover it at Skills Fair. We just keep talking about it. And quite honestly, they just start educating themselves when um, they get frustrated like you with the care of these patients. And then they are like, oh, wait, wait, we have that um, order set. Yeah. And they just remind the providers, hey, we, we, and I have the providers save it all to their favorites too. Yeah, I think that's such a great, like, as long as, you know, it's like the nurses have to know that it exists, that that order set is there, right? So that they can advocate and say, but we have this in right. place, please mm -hmm. use it, right? Like, <laughs> that's so great. I love that. Great. Wow, this was such a good conversation. I'm so glad that this happened. Thank you so much, Amy, for sharing. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and that's the whole point of these calls is so we can share resources, um, and we can learn together and we can be vulnerable um, because this is the safe space to talk about it before we have to deal with it in person. Um, so I am going to share my screen again. Uh, see if I can do this. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now we've heard a little bit we heard from Amy about how well her screening rates are going, and we heard from Abby about um, how their implementation of the patient data sheet is going. Um, I wanted to talk about how everyone else's implementation of um, collecting data, data methods was going. Um, 
We know we're kind of in the thick of it. Uh, July 1st is the reporting deadline. Um, so we wanted to see how that patient data sheet implementation was going. Uh, if anyone had any recommendations, um, just kind of wanted to have an open conversation. And we've been getting some questions in our email <clears throat> about um, suggestions on how to implement it. Um, so if anything has been going well for people or bad for people on the other end of the spectrum, um, you can chat it in or come off mute. Um, I know it's not as fun of a topic as the clinical stuff, but yeah. I am wondering if any, well, I'm behind the eight ball on this um, for sure. But what I noticed is that my chosen collaboratives, my colleagues are already um, collecting half of this data. Has anybody figured out how to merge the two and integrate? You know, we have some other chosen hospitals. Um, for those don't don't know, chosen. I don't want to replicate data. Yeah. Um, collection. So I just was curious if anybody's figured that out yet. Yeah, for those that don't know, chosen is the um, quality improvement collaborative for opiate exposed newborns. Um, so somewhat similar. This one's a little more maternal based, but are any other hospitals uh, having luck with like EMR polls of the data? Okay, then my next question is, am I just supposed to be submitting the data for the patients that screen high risk for the audit C plus two? Is that like a good place to start? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so there's kind of two sections of the data. There is the data that is very similar to last year, since you were in the collaborative last year, it's overall screening rates. Um, and then this year, AIM has asked us to break that down um, a little bit further by payer. Um, and hopefully that should be pretty simplistic with the EMR. Um, but then the patient data sheet side is for any patient that screens positive on your substance use screener. So for you, it's the audit C plus two, those patients are receiving that secondary patient data sheet, which can serve as like a clinical checklist. Um, you're not handing the patient anything, but it basically goes over um, making sure that you're seeing the patient, that they were screened, that they did screen positive, and then they were referred to treatment. So you're making sure that when you do get those high risk patients that they're getting like specified follow-up treatment. Um, so kind of like Kaylin was saying that you're not just treating the patient, having this whole conversation inpatient, and then you just like let them go into the world. You want to make sure you're having that follow-up treatment for them um, as this is like one pinpoint of where we know they are. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Um, I know that a couple hospitals have started inputting that data into REDCap. Um, don't feel like you're too far behind. This is, again, it's a quality improvement process, so you don't have to be perfect the first time around. Um, it's really to make sure that those patients, like we focused on that screening now, but making sure that we're also doing that referral treatment. So um, yes, there's a couple hospitals I know that Good Samaritan has been doing a really good job with entering that data. Um, and who else? St. Vincent's in Montana. Um, I don't know if they're on the call. I'm trying to look through. Um, has anyone been <clears throat> successful with um, how they have used that clinical care checklist? Oh, it looks like there's some in the chat. Yeah, there's a, there's, I was just going to say, I didn't want to interrupt you in case someone talks. There's a question about marijuana. Uh, and I think you and Katie have discussed that before with some of the teams. Yes. So <clears throat> if we've decided that um, for cannabis, that since it's so prevalent in the state of Colorado, if the patient um, solely screens positive for just um, cannabis, then you don't have to complete that patient data sheet or enter it into REDCap. Um, we do recommend um, that you do and that you are ensuring that um, you're getting those patients the appropriate follow-up care. Um, but what we're um, stating is that if there's cannabis, it's like a poly substance, so it's cannabis and something else, um, then you should do the patient data sheet. 
Um, and then Michelle said, uh, we do not have a large population, so we're waiting to get a batch before we submit to Red Cap. Yeah, that's awesome. That was one of my questions that I was going to ask. Um, I know some teams are doing it like they have kind of, um, they're doing it methodically where they're doing it in batches. And then some people are like, they get one and they start inputting it. Either is fine, um, kind of whatever works for you. Um, the red cap follows exactly that patient data sheet. So should be pretty simple, like plug and chug. Um, but I get you all are really busy. Um, Brooke and Alicia, um, does those answer your questions about cannabis? Awesome. <clears throat> Does anyone else have any specific questions about data entry or the patient data sheet? Similar, Sarah. Um, so Sarah asked, um, the patient also has a spot to choose nicotine use. Are we supposed to be collecting data on those patients as well? Um, like I was saying, uh, ideally, um, the patient data sheet is used as a clinical care checklist. So if they do screen positive for substance use, you're using it as a way to refer them to treatment. Um, but um, again, uh, similar to cannabis, uh, we're gonna be following that same kind of methodology. We don't want to like increase your workload, but we also want to make sure that all these patients who are screen positive for substance use, um, which is known to impact um, prenatal outcomes, that they are being referred appropriately. And if you do enter it, if you are collecting them for patients who just simply have cannabis, that's totally fine. The more data, the better, um, the better feedback we can give you. Um, that's just like, if you have such a large volume and it's just becoming overwhelming because you have like, I can't imagine how many you would have, but um, it's the more patient data sheets, the better, um, I guess. <clears throat> Okay, um, if you have any more questions about that, feel free to email me. Um, we understand that it can be confusing um, and we wanna make sure that you understand the process. Um, but I will move forward. Let's see. So um, in these calls, every couple of months, we're doing more of like a collaborative session rather than hearing from experts. Um, and so today we wanted to talk about um, PDSA cycles, um, which are the plan, do, study, act cycles, which I have up in the, <clears throat> for me, it's the right-hand corner. Um, and we were, just wanted to talk about um, if there was any teams that were having a challenge and we wanted to work on a group PDSA together to kind of get the process down um, and also benefit that team if they're willing to volunteer a challenge. Because um, I'm sure many of the challenges that you all are experiencing are pretty similar. Um, so if there's a team um, that would want to volunteer a challenge that they're having, then we as a group can go through some ideas of tests of change that um, you could try. Um, and <clears throat> I will stop sharing my screen for a second so I can put this link in the chat for you all. Um, there's a new chat too. From there's there's a chat. <clears throat> yeah. okay. Hold on, Brooke. So Brooke asked, so <clears throat> we want to make sure patients who screen positive for marijuana and nicotine have social work referrals with options of community resources is sufficient. Correct. Um, so we just want to make sure that we're getting those patients referred. And if using that clinical care checklist is helpful for you, go for it. Um, but if it's simply those, you don't have to do the data input if it's too um, onerous for you. Um, <clears throat> so I... We have been using on some of our national calls this thing called Jamboard, um, which 
Um, it's pretty easy to use. I just put the link in the chat. I mean, so a way to collaborate on all our different computers so that um, we're all compiling it on one sheet and then it can be shared um, elsewhere. Um, so I see people are entering the Jamboard, but um, it's kind of like a whiteboard, but we can all do it virtually. Um, and on the left-hand side of the Jamboard, um, let me share my screen again. <clears throat> So on the left-hand side of the Jamboard, you'll see this um, icon and it creates a sticky note, which allows you, so you can type in like, hi, click save, and then it will generate a sticky note and you can drag it around the screen. I mean, everyone can generate one and it's not tied to um, each other. So if anyone wants to volunteer a challenge that they're having at their hospital, um, we as a group can start adding sticky notes of tests of change that um, that team could try um, so that they could start doing that plan, do, study, act cycle. Does anyone have um, a challenge that they're having? So Brooke, <clears throat> separate question, but <laughs> was looking for the audit C questionnaire on paper. We do it on the computer. We wanted to try the written form for the patient to fill out on their own. Um, where in the team resources folder is that located? I don't know off the top of my head, but I can send it to you. <laughs> it should be in the screeners folder, but I'm not sure off the top of my head. I know some of you have challenges with implementation. It doesn't have to be a big challenge. It can be kind of a small challenge. I'm okay with awkward silences until someone answers. <laughs> you can also chat it in if you don't wanna talk. Social work is busy and sometimes feels rushed. Okay, knowing what to do with a positive initial screen, we have the long screen on paper in the provider's workstation, but it seems like a small crisis every time, just getting all the same <clears throat> page has been challenging. Great, these are awesome. Um, so if we wanna start with the one in green, um, social work is busy and sometimes feels rushed. Um, people, if you wanna start putting in sticky notes of maybe some, um, solutions to this, otherwise known as tests of change that they could try um, that uh, might be helpful to uh, implement um, and see if it will work or not. Um, I'll try to think of some off the top of my head too. I know it's kind of hard to think on the spot, but um, maybe um, if you get more people on your team expert trained, um, then they would feel more comfortable with having those kind of um, harder conversations that usually social work does, but being like um, saying that you have these resources um, and while you wait for social work, um, they can peruse this resource guide that you have um, or, um, something along those lines. I don't know if anyone has <clears throat> had similar challenges like this that they might have a solution to. You can add in your sticky notes or you can chat it in or you can come off mute. If you want to keep thinking about it, we can move over to the other one. <clears throat> the other one says, um, I guess I'll just chime in for the sake of camaraderie and that we have a challenge of social work that we don't usually even have a social worker like at all for our unit and so the nurses end up having to do everything and so it's just 
challenging to try to figure out how to make all of that happen. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. What are some ways? I don't ways- know that I have a solution. I yeah. just have <laughs> a, I empathize with you and that we end up doing all that and or calling for our, the expert team to come. Um, that's what we've done because none of us have been expert trained prior to last week when a couple of us got trained. Um, and so we would just have to call for the, our, our hospital wide Centura has like an expert team that will come and then evaluate a patient. Um, and so hopefully now we can make it a little bit better since we have a few people as we're trained. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think just like, I understand that like you all are not social workers. That's not what you aim to do, but having some kind of like little piece of knowledge to kind of take a, <clears throat> take away that kind of rush time for social work can be super helpful, I think. Um, so um, be able to have those conversations so it's not awkward and you're relying on social work or um, having materials that you can hand to them because I do know you're busy. Um, I think that that could be something that you could try um, and test it out and see if that would work to try to relieve some of that um, burden for social work. If you have social work or um, if you don't have social work, making it so that you feel a little bit more prepared in that situation. Um, I think those would be my initial ideas. Um, So we wanna move on to the other one. It says, knowing what to do with a positive initial screen. We have the long screener on paper in the provider's workstation, but it seems like a small crisis every time. Just getting everyone on the same page has been challenging. Um, I don't know who put this in there, but maybe what I'm guessing you're saying is that um, every time you have a positive screen, you don't know necessarily what to do for the follow-up. <clears throat> Correct. It's Mick. Um, oh, hi. <laughs> it's, it's been interesting. Sometimes our providers and nurses, so like the nurses know they're screening and then we had put it onto our providers to then um, initiate the long screen. And maybe we just need to put it on the nurses. I love what she presented about how their EMR then triggers that long screen. And maybe we just need to trigger our nurses to give it and then get go from there with the provider so I don't know it's just always like a little bit of a panic what do I do yeah and then what is the providers are like I don't know what to do either and it's just (laughs) like how much education you give but there's always still that barrier it seems but once we get the right people here it it goes pretty smoothly from there yeah I um I think the EMR definitely helps with that but I know that it took Amy a while to get that into the EMR um I mean just thinking about like for me what would be helpful is like maybe like a flow sheet um, of just like, okay, you have your patient. Um, did they screen like positive? Like, okay, X, Y, and Z, here's what we would do. Um, and then being like, okay, you have <clears throat> like, okay, if they screen positive for substance use, like you reach out to blah, blah, blah. You give them like the resource sheet. Um, and you make sure that you document it in their chart or something like that. Um, I just know, yeah, like an algorithm or some way of um, making it more black and white. Um, I don't know if something like that would help. Um. And it's hard when you like <clears throat> are at a smaller hospital and these situations don't come up as much. So you don't get that kind of muscle memory of it. We're getting there. It's just, um, yeah. I, the algorithm's a good idea. We have algorithms for everything. So it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, Brooke mentions if you already have a flow sheet like that made, um, if they screen positive for something, what would be the next tool you use? Okay. 
Well, these are just some examples. Um, I know it's really hard to come up with these steps and have a moment in your day to think um, creatively about how you can implement things. Um, and we're always here if you ever need to kind of use us as like a bounce back board. Um, but this was like just a good example of like that planning stage. The next step would be to do, do, the do part of the cycle. Um, study would be analyzing, see if it worked. And then act is choosing if you're gonna adopt that or abandon it or adapt it. Um, so you're welcome to come back to this jam board, think about it a little bit. Um, but just wanted to use this as a time to kind of think about it as a group, um, hear if anyone has had these similar challenges. So thank you for everyone for sharing. Um, let me jump back to my PowerPoint. Um, so before we end, um, we have only received qualitative data from the following hospitals. So thank you for submitting it. Um, but if you have not submitted your data, please do so. Um, I know it can seem tiring. You don't have to go into a ton of depth, but um, it helps us get kind of a quick check to see where you're at, um, see how you're doing, if you need any materials, um, and we can provide you with feedback <clears throat> from there. Oh, PowerPoint's going haywire. Um, Brooke, do you already have a flow sheet like that made? Um, I can definitely make one up. That was the first time I even thought of it. This was a great creative session for me. So I can make one and I can put it in the team resources folder. Um, and then maybe you all can test that out, see how it goes. Um, I know that, yeah, the Sterling binder had some good resources. Um, so uh, I can see if they, I know that's in the team resources folder, but I can see if they can send me the um, digital copy of that. Um, so yeah, if you haven't turned in your April qualitative data, please do so. Um, and then before we leave, um, I just wanna share our normal evaluation poll. Um, if you could just take a couple seconds to answer this, that would be amazing. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us today. I'll let you out a few minutes early after you do the poll. Um, and I re really appreciate you all participating and being vulnerable. Um, and our next coaching call is in June. And I believe that it is an Aloxone training. Um, so one that you definitely don't want to miss. Um, but yeah, it was great seeing you all. Um, and have a great rest of your day.